Hey there gents and gentettes, my name's Spazzy, aka Syndrums, aka Pocket NG on Emerald and C, and welcome to this little tutorial. For me, one of my most favorite things about Planetside 2 is its scope, and the fact that its combined arms setup allows the player to enjoy a wide selection of playstyles. You got infantry, you got air and ground vehicles, and the map, for the most part, allows you to both enjoy them all at the same time, or in complete isolation from one another if you, you know, feel like it. Now, whether or not that's actually a good thing, and the topic on how and to what extent these participating groups can and should interact with one another is, in fact, always a hot topic here, so I'm sure all of you have your own thoughts on the matter, but in this video in specific, I wanted to talk exclusively about a certain type of gameplay, which is the role of the designated Repair Sunday, because let's face it, not everyone can be a 3KDR heavy. Let's get the usual stuff out of the way though. First of all, everything that I'm about to say is from my own experiences when it comes to being a Reptus driver. Um, these experiences work for me with the current kits that I have unlocked on this character, so I'm not saying that this should be your Repusing doctrine because you might need to adjust a few things for it to work for you. But as long as you find some of these tips and approaches useful enough to append to your already existing gameplay and preferences, that in by itself is perfectly fine, and that just means that this tutorial is doing its job. And third, this video is not about grinding certs. It's obviously no small wonder as to why people suggest engineers and medics for new players, especially ammo and rep buses. But this tutorial is actually the exact opposite. It's going to be about how to dump your existing certs into whatever maximizes your usefulness as an engineer first and foremost, with very little to no thought regarding cert gain. To the point where we'll actually be including stuff like nanite boosters, so if you're ready for that sort of levels of commitment to this role, then let's begin. Right, so, as a rep bus NG, uh, I think it's wise to start this tutorial off with getting you in the right sort of mentality as to what your primary focus is. I'm going to mostly cover two situations. One, you are a lead repair bus, where you're closely or even exclusively working with a lead tank, or as a designated repair bus inside of a larger fire team with two or more main battle tanks and their gunners. The first and foremost rule for the rep bus is genuinely straightforward. Keep your target alive with a minimum interference on your part. But obviously, that doesn't tell us jack hell. And uh, yeah, uh, so when playing with a squad or a, just an ongoing armor column, there is a lead tank. The lead tank watches and designates targets for the rest of your armor column, and so does his gunner. They have a job to do. Your primary job in the meantime is to make sure that at any given time, their need to break contact and roll back to repair themselves is reduced as much as possible. It's never going to be a zero chance, obviously, but funnily enough, your capability of repair a singular target is actually pretty substantial, so yeah. Uh, at the same time, you need to try to not interfere with whatever it is that they're doing. They need to be able to reverse or stop without you blocking or ramming into them, and at the same time, you need to keep up with their vehicle. You cannot constantly yell at them to stop and let you repair them. And at the same time, you need to keep your own head on a swivel, because you can't pull them away to heal you. The same idea really applies to working as a part of a fire team, but instead of keeping up with your main tank, you must position yourself in a way to cover as many vehicles as physically possible and provide them with a safe place to go back for emergency repairs, while at the same time keeping the other vehicles topped off from a distance when they're outside of that range. If I had to give a hallmark of a good pocket NG, I would say that it is the ability to not only repair, but also to keep up as well as skirt around and maneuver among your friendlies in a way that makes you invisible to them while at the same time uh, keeping your own vehicle alive without their help, and thankfully for an engineer you actually have many tools to let you do this. So here's my first major tip for this video uh, before I start listing these tools. If you want to be a repost driver, and you have not put any certs in your NG until now, and after seeing this list that you know that you don't have enough free search to max all these things out, you must first make sure that you have all of these items unlocked before maxing them out, instead of doing it one by one. 
The only exception to this rule is the racer chassis, and I will talk about that a little bit later. You will need all of these tools because they are used in different situations. So even though this tutorial is named after the repair bus, the bus itself is only a single part of your overall repair capabilities as an engineer, and each one of these tools will be used in different situations. Uh, obviously I am getting a little bit too ahead of myself, so let's look at our soldier first and touch up on the bus itself later. Right, so this here is my pocket NG. This is my character on Emerald NC, and it is currently, at the time of recording this video, a battle rank 56. This character is around two months old and has been created for the purpose of this tutorial, and you can find the full stats on it down in the video description. And this is his loadout page. Now, I actually have three loadouts, all of which uh, vary only in minor details about what implants or what mines they have, but we are going to be focusing on this first tab for now. As a pocket NG, your build will be maximizing your support role first and foremost, and your combat capabilities are going to be in such a afterthought that they might as well be in a different time zone altogether. Uh, so for example, while the engineer class has access to many cool toys such as the archer for example, your primary slot is going to be taken up by the relatively new addition that is the Punisher SMG. Now, much more knowledgeable players than myself can tell you about how good of an SMG the SMG actually is, but the part of it that interests us in particular is its underbarrel mod, which changes from class to class. Uh, for the engineer in specific, it takes the form of a repair grenade launcher, and this tool in your inventory will cover two purposes. One, it allows you to heal small amounts, aka chip damage, from a very long distances in a way that you haven't been able to do until now, unless you wanted to waste 75 nanites worth of repair grenades, and it is also very easy to use up close on your own Sunder on the move, as you can slow down, jump out of the vehicle, slap the underbarrel grenade launcher on it, discharge, get back in, and just keep moving. The repair underbarrel grenade does exactly half of the repair value of a regular repair grenade, which is 250 points, which at first might seem to be not a lot, but in practice it makes up for it because it delivers those 250 points in the span of 4 seconds before you can reapply the effect. In comparison with the actual nano repair grenade, it takes a few seconds to start working after you throw it, after which you'll repair 500 units of damage over the span of 10 seconds. More on that later. Also, the Punisher is currently the only weapon in the game, as far as I can tell, that can have two modifications applied to its single underbarrel slot. So you can have, for example, the underbarrel grenade and a laser sight or an extended magazine selected at the same time. I should also make note that if you apply the repair effect, you will also boost your vehicle's health by an additional 500 points for the duration of those 4 seconds. And I will be honest with you, I have not had a chance to actually gauge the usefulness of this effect, because the buffer HP don't actually swallow incoming damage. The underbarrel grenades themselves, just like their explosive counterparts, can be resupplied from your own ammo packs, which means that in theory you have an unlimited amount of repair ammo. In practice, however, that just means that you don't drain your nanite pool when you keep resupplying. There are a few things to keep in mind about using the launcher, though. As I already said just now, it heals and applies the health boost effect for the duration of 4 seconds. But be sure you actually wait that long before hitting your target again. Just like with the regular nanite repair grenade, only one grenade can be active at a time. Also, a fun fact, do not resupply from a sunderer after you just hit a target, because it is going to cancel the effect. Uh, that being said, uh, those underbarrel grenades have the capability to repair multiple vehicles, as they do have a tiny splash area, so you can shoot between two friendly vehicles and apply this healing effect for both, just that they would have to be very close together. That's not really advisable. The underbarrel repair grenade, unlike its regular nano grenade counterpart, does not have its own collision box, which means that it's actually much safer to use on air vehicles as they come to hover above your bus. 
never throw repair grenades at aircraft that are moving, as well as never use them in Valkyries, because depending on your ping, the grenade and the Valk will collide and either make the vehicle just outright explode, or it is going to take control away from the pilot, or might even flip the vehicle around. The underbarrel grenade does not do that and can be safely used from the Valk Rumble Seed, though it can obviously only be used twice, since you cannot restock in mid-air. Another good time to use this launcher is when you are repairing a stationary target with your repair tool and it is slowly starting to overheat, so instead of wasting time by just letting it cool off, instead you switch to your Punisher, you pop a grenade, switch back to your repair tool, and by that time it's already cooled down. In other words, the Punisher SMG, or to be more precise, it's a grenade launcher add-on, is one of the newest toys for a pocket NG, and given its wide range of use, I would say it is a must-have of this point. But again, it's only one of your tools that you use to repair things, so don't get fixated on it. The only reason it occupies such a chunk of our tutorial thus far is simply because it has so many nuances. So then, next up we have our secondary slot. Uh, this one I usually occupy with an explosive crossbow launcher. It gives me limited anti-vehicle capabilities. If there's something on fire next to me, it just needs to get shot in the face. Uh, if you are a ASP NG, feel free to put a shotgun here or something with a dark light flashlight for situations where your armor column is standing still and some rando stalker info wants to get cheeky. I simply use the crossbow because I use my Amaterasu knife as my actual secondary, which leaves me a little bit more choices in this matter, so this is one of the slots that it is completely up to you how you fill out. Uh, as for us, we are going to go to our third slot, which is the basic bread and butter repair tool. It has a lot of advantages over the Punisher, in that it has a heat mechanic instead of ammo, and it's simply outright stronger in terms of how much health per second you can restore with it, which is around 150 per second. But it also requires you to be outside of your vehicle and within range of what it is you are repairing, so you risk not only receiving damage, but also you really can't look away from whatever it is that you're repairing, so you are losing a lot of situational awareness, both in terms of incoming danger and also the health of your remaining friendly vehicles. So, when it comes to being a repair center driver, the repair tool will come in handy mostly in three separate situations. If your armor column have set up a firing line and you're taking occasional shots with, uh, which are not out repaired by your sunder, you can double that repair potential by bolstering them with your repair tool. Just make sure that you're not standing behind the vehicle that you're repairing, otherwise that's a good way to get squished. Likewise, you will be using this tool to repair your own sunder during downtimes where you can stop and do it yourself. The repair tool is also one of the more direct contributors to emergency repairs if your target gets inside cover. So if you have a tank on fire, get your Sunday within its range, use it to block incoming shots if you have to, and then apply a repair grenade while you are making towards the target, then apply your repair tool. If things are bad and the target's owner and gunner are also repairing that vehicle, it will be up in no time. And while it is easy to just use your crossbow or vehicle weapons to blow up mines, sometimes it's impossible to do that without causing a lot of damage to your own vehicles. That's where your repair tool comes in. For example, a popular tactic against Colossi tanks is to drop engineers from Valkyries, Galaxies, or indeed from ejection CDSFs on top of the target and place down anti-vehicle mines underneath it. If you are quick enough to kill that NG, you will still need to defuse them with your repair tools alt fire mode. This also works on enemy C4, but in that case, the bricks of C4 will despawn when the killed player respawns themselves. Uh, by the way, the only reason I even bothered mentioning that is the sheer amount of seemingly high-ranked players who end up shooting enemy mines and just destroying their own vehicles. So apparently the disarming thing is not really that big of a common knowledge as I initially thought. Uh, but let's keep going on to the next topic on our loadout, which is your suit slots. Uh, the first one is your ability slot, and while it's rather costly in terms of certs, having a Spitfire auto turret with you is actually extremely important, but also kind of nuanced. So, to reiterate, the Spitfire Auto Turret is a deployable weapon that will open fire on enemy players within its range of 50 meters and can be placed down multiple times without having to restock, and it is on a cooldown. 
Uh, unlike the player's base turrets, the Spitfires cannot attack anything outside of its 50 meter range, even if it is being shot by an enemy. The Spitfires are useful for anti-infantry defense only when they are set up in large enough numbers so that the DPS actually add up to something. But its primary usefulness to you as a pocket NG is that its alert noise and its subsequent firing noise acts like an alert to the presence of enemy infantry, and you can, by looking at where that turret is pointing at, figure out where they're coming from. For seasoned armor players, the sound of a Spitfire going off is directly associated to a flight or fight response, because that usually indicates a light assault with C4 in the area, so they will usually start moving if they hear that thing. As for the owner of the repair bus, you are relatively safe from being insta-killed by two bricks of C4, as long as you are at full health at the time, which by the way is another reason why you have to keep yourself topped off. But there is also a small downside to the Spitfire. Once you deploy it on the ground, and a few seconds pass during which the turret will not track enemies, it is afterwards not harmed by ramming damage from vehicles both friendly and enemy. It stops them dead in their tracks. Now, what this means are two things. First of all, if you're outside of your Sunderer and an enemy harasser or other vehicle is running around and trying to roll to kill you, you'll just feel afraid to duck behind your Spitfire. But at the same time, it means that if you put your Spitfire in the way of a friendly vehicle, they might take unnecessary damage or even die because they have to try to maneuver around it. Or when it's important they have to move back or forward in the case of, say, orbital strikes or in the case of a Colossus. When the Colossus deploys, people are very keen to help protect the damn thing, but sometimes they place their Spitfires inside of the shield bubble which is really nice and all until someone jumps on top of it with anti-tank mines and it cannot pack up and leave because it cannot drive through the friendly Spitfires and it just tends to die. There are a few things to remember though. At the time recording this video, which is not soon after the implementation of the Colossus tank, there is a new bug slash feature with the Spitfire turret in the sense that when you put it down on the ground and it deploys, you actually have to wait for a few seconds when it actually appears before getting inside of the vehicle. If you place it down and enter your, your Sunderer at once, it is not going to spawn. That's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, the second one is that the infiltrator decoy grenades will cause the turrets to lock onto them and ignore any enemy players in the area. Also, if you are using Cover Drop, which makes you invisible once you hit the ground, both Spitfires as well as player base turrets will still track and attack you even while you are cloaked, because your cloak is not like the Infiltrator cloak. What I tend to do, and this is something you will see during the practical examples of the latter part of this video, is that I put these turrets down on some sort of elevated spot next to my Sunday if possible. Somewhere that I know our vehicles are not going to go, and at the same time, the elevated situation makes it very easy for me to just look up and see what it is shooting at. The other two mana turrets in the slot are not exactly useful for our role as a pocket engineer. They have their uses, yes, and I do believe that the anti-vehicle turret is just criminally underrated, but let's move on. Right then, next up we have our suit and grenade slots, and for the pocket NG there's only one and one choice in these categories, which is the nanite repair grenade coupled with a grenade bandolier. Now, this is easily, in my opinion anyway, one of the most important parts of your kit, and of course I know a few people are going to start yelling at me for saying that, but listen up. Vehicles move. Yeah, bold statements all around. Uh, vehicles move, and your repair bus only has a range of 30 meters in which you can apply your proxy repair field. This means that in actual combat situations, you will often find yourself not only unable to cover everyone at the same time, but also even if you're assigned to only focus on one vehicle alone, in this case the lead tank, they themselves will often move outside of your range. And make no mistake, any damage taken adds up over time. There's no situation where you have to, and I quote, start to worry about healing a friendly vehicle. If it has taken damage, it needs to be repaired as soon as possible. And your repair grenade does exactly that. Find a chance to stick this to a friendly vehicle, and it's going to provide 10 seconds of guaranteed repairs to it, and anything within 10 meter radius regardless of where it moves off to. Your main proxy repair will also not outrep most of the incoming damage either way, so using the repair grenade to provide ongoing additional repair to your target will increase its lifetime. 
Also, until the Punisher came around, the Nano Grenade was really the only way to get repairs to things outside of your reach, especially when you had to cross no man's land to get to a vehicle that has gone inside of cover. Also, in situations where things get crowded and you cannot physically get your bus close enough without causing issues for the other vehicles, this grenade is going to help you. Picking out the most damaged vehicle and chucking the repair grenade in their general direction is a very good chance to increase their survival even when you cannot get to them on your bus. And most importantly, it is one of the only ways you can repair yourself on the move. Unless your column is large enough to be running at two or more repair buses, your Punisher rep grenades, your fire suppression is really going to be the only other alternatives to keep yourself alive apart from the repair grenade. The issue is that the fire suppression, even when maxed out, still has a sizable cooldown period and the Punisher only heals for 250 points, so if you have to repair on the move, you can only fire it at once. There is no time to reload after all. There is, however, time to stick a nano grenade to the side of your bus before packing up and not having to worry about repairs for the next 10 seconds, until which you can then jump out again, do it again, and continue on going. In most engagements, all of your vehicles will be way outside of that 30 meter repair field of your rep bus anyway, so being able to chuck 500 units of repair to fix a vehicle on the other side of the column is a very important thing to do. Also, there are plenty of situations where a grenade would push a friendly vehicle above its quote smoking levels to stop making them stand out for enemy players. I keep noticing that I repair most of my overall hit points by utilizing the rep grenade simply because I tend to act as a lead sunderer. Uh, so I have to focus all of my other attention to the lead tank. So the nano grenades allows me to quote, throw and forget if it is being stuck to a vehicle that I'm not allowed to break off and repair. The repair bus tends to gain a completely different role in this case, so where instead of your main mode of repairs, it just keeps you supplied with rep grenades. Now, as you might have expected, this versatility does come with a major price in that it actually costs nanites to resupply your grenades. So much so that larger engagements will run you dry even if you are a paid member and you already get that bonus and enjoy the increased nanite gain. Have you ever wondered why the game has a boost for nanites of all things? A currency that replenishes over time and for free? Yeah, it's for masochists like us who throw rep grenades as fast as they stop repairing, keeping that 500 per nade health ticks to our buses and friendly vehicles. The new addition of Merit and being able to buy 30 minute nano boosters for Merit is easily one of the best additions to the game. If you aren't ready to commit to this role to the point of running double 7 day nano boosters with Daybreak Cash, you should have at least a few of these in stock. They are relatively cheap in terms of merit, and as you'll see in a moment, the other items you can buy for merit are not really that useful anyway. But just like with the previous tools, the rep grenades themselves come with a few nuances of their own. The rep grenade itself, just like ammo packs, mines and so on, do have a collision box, and no offense to the devs, but anything that is in any way related to physics in this game is a little bit, um, a little bit jank, yeah. For the same reason, don't use sticker grenades in Valks. Also, remember that only one repair grenade can be active at a time from the same player, and likewise, only one player's rep grenade can influence a single target. So don't waste nanites by trying to stick two in a row, and if you see a already active repair grenade healing a vehicle, perhaps you should wait until it expires before tossing your own. Unlike the Punisher, however, if you already have an active repair grenade, restocking from a terminal or sunderer will not despawn that grenade. The repair grenade, in short, is a very good supplement to your existing repair capabilities. If you wanted a analog to MM Warpagers, then imagine that whenever you stick your repair grenade to a vehicle that is already within your repair target's field, it increases the repair output by about 30% for 10 seconds. The repair grenade is a must-have tool in my opinion, and I find myself using it a lot. The only other downside to it is really its high dependence on your nanite pool, which for non-paying users will be a limiting factor. Moving on, next up is your utility slot, and for me, mines are really the obvious choice. 
Armor columns are always going to be targets for cloak flashes, you have your harassers, you have your people trying to uh, flank you, so being able to drop a few mines in a line away from your bus, which is, you know, usually the attack vector, or at least an obvious route to approach your current location, will at least, if not kill them, will give the enemy enough damage where a single AP shell from a main battle tank can take them out. I swap out my AT mines for AP mines whenever I have to babysit a Colossus. As already mentioned before, the current meta for dealing with Colossi is to drop engineers on top of it. And since these engineers must have their flak armor uh, removed and replaced with mine carrier, a pair of bouncing Bettys will usually stop them dead in their tracks. Again, these things share the same nanite pool with your repair grenades, so keep an eye on them and be ready to disable the auto resupply if you run without boosters. Um, going on, I already mentioned the melee slot for this loadout. You'll find a Amaterasu here, which in practice, again, is a slug shotgun, which just happens to have a very slow projectile speed. It takes a while to get used to, but it's especially amazing against crouch spamming enemies, because that tactic does not really work against this thing. And now we come to the fun part, the implants. Uh, the implants, unlike all of the previous other things I talked about, cannot really be selectively obtained with certs directly, so whichever you happen to have, you will use, but here's a few of the ones that I personally keep swapping between. First of all, we have target focus. I use it to increase the IFF distance on friendly vehicles, makes it kind of easier for me to pick out and uh, center on them to see what their health is. Another good pick, if you happen to have it, is the Bionics Implant, uh, because having a health bar that regenerates on its own without having to depend on medics and leaving me free to swap out medkits for mines is an amazingly cool thing to have. Uh, next up, we have Counterintelligence, another exceptional implant just like the previous one, and it's really useful for when you get blindsided by infantry or anti-vehicle weapons. Just look at the minimap and you will see who shot you from where. Sweeper Hood is also very useful, but I mostly use it when I l run with a Colossus. Again, since people drop on top of it with mines, I need to kind of know which mines are still active. The game currently has this terrible habit of exploding C4 and anti-tank mines, but not actually removing the model of the mine or C4 itself, so making me waste trying to try to disarm it with my repair tool. So, yeah. I've heard some good things about Electrotech, but be very careful regarding its maxed out rank, which, if triggered, destroys enemy explosives. So going back to those AT mines and the Colossi, if you have enemy engineers uh, drop on top of them and then someone accidentally runs you over or shoots you, your Electrotech implant will damage or even destroy the Colossus by detonating the mines that are underneath it. And now for your tactical slot. This is where things get somewhat tricky, because none of these things are important enough to unlock instead of using the merit for, say, nanite boosters, but if you have them unlocked, or you tend to buy boosters for daybreak cash anyway, I would suggest the canopy. It is a very good thing against small arms fire, or to shelter yourself from ESF nose guns, but it's also very good to take a shot from a Dalton to save your vehicle, if you're trying to repair and intercept lock-on missiles. You see, the lock-on missiles from infantry launchers will always hit the same spot, so sometimes, depending on the terrain, you can put them in front of their path. It's not going to eat too many of them before it gets disabled, but just enough. It also has no collision box, so feel free to put it whatever you like without having to worry about friendlies trying to maneuver around it. This took a little bit longer than expected, but three-fourths of your repair busing kit happens to be not the bus itself, so keep that in mind before you go on. Speaking of the bus, let's take a look at it. Meet Francis, the repair bus, and you will notice that I specifically went for an exterior design that screams repairs here, which includes the paint job as well. I like to think that it helps friendlies to recognize me at a glance, but there's no real way to tell, so I know I'm not really gonna go there. But I will have to start this list by skipping a few slots and pointing you directly towards the performance slot. Racer chassis. You need to have it. Being faster than your main battle tanks is vital, because just keeping up with the armor column does not cut it. As a repair bus, you need to be able to close distance while on the move at full speed and get your repair field within range. 
Maxing out your racer chassis is instrumental to your repair bus, even more so than the proxy repairer itself. Again, look at the previous things that I've said in this video. Your potential without it is cut by a sizable chunk. Yes, that's true, but as long as you have a Sunday to resupply your grenades, your Punisher, your whatever, and you can keep up with your armor column, the current level of your proxy repair does not really matter all that much, though of course you will need to max it out as soon as possible. But with that important note out of the way, let's take a look at the rest of the setup, starting from the weapons. Now, the Sunday weapons in most cases are a nerfed version of their counterparts on the account of the Sunder being a support vehicle and rocking two of these things. Your default Basilisk will have a slower rate of fire in comparison to their Harasser or their main battle tank counterparts, and the Sunder version of the Ranger, for example, is going to have a slightly less damage. Now, talking about the Sunday weapons is tricky, because perhaps only excluding the Fury, I personally have found that all of these weapons have their own uses, and once you have, you know, once you have them actually sorted out, but I can offer you this simple advice. It all depends on who is gunning for you. If it is your outfit mates, if it's people whose gunning skill and their preferences are known to you, give them specialized weapons. If it's going to be randos, stick to simple weapons such as basilisks. Likewise, if you are the only Sunderer in your armor column, and you don't have a Sky Guard, go with Walkers or Rangers. The Ranger is good at deterring air from attacking your column, as the flak effect it produces is usually scary enough to make the enemy break off the attack. The Walker, in the meantime, is much more subtle in the damage that it deals, and usually allows for a bigger chance to actually kill the target that's harassing you. Really though, your choice of weapons is going to be limited to whatever you have unlocked first and foremost, but even the default basilisks are completely adequate middle ground for all scenarios for the most part, and it is a weapon most players can use very easily. As for your utility slot, my suggestion is to run at fire suppression and use it as often as possible. Repairing yourself without wasting time to get out of the vehicle or have people do it for you is one of your jobs as a pocket NG, and even though the fire suppression even at its max rank needs 45 seconds to rearm itself, using it in terms of health is the same as sticking a nano repair grenade and a punisher grenade at the same time, all over the span of 5 seconds. Also, remember, it actually stacks with those things, so in my opinion, fire suppression is the way to go here, as neither of the two alternative choices, smoke or GSD, are good enough to be worth considering as alternatives. Though, since GSD does disable any and all collision damage, it can help you in large armor columns, where the lack of fire suppression is offset simply by the presence of other repair vehicles and work instead as a deterrent against stupid people in flashes or lightnings or harassers who drive too closely and may glitch into you and just make you explode. Next up is, similar to your repair tool, the bread and butter of the repair bus, the Nanite Proximity Repair System. And there is really nothing much to say about it. It starts off at 25 health per second repair strength, and once it maxed out, it is set to 150, which is similar to your repair tool. There is really nothing much I can really say about this, apart from the fact that the 30 meters range is in practice not a lot. Also, only one Sunder repair field may influence a single vehicle at the same time, and whoever has the higher ranked field will repair that target. If you have two maxed out repair buses, whoever gets within range first of the target gets the repair ticks. Lastly, it should be noted that the 30 meter range on the Red Bus repair field is not actually 30 meters for those of us who actually use the metric system. It feels as about half of this distance in practice, and so anything that is two widths of a tank away from you will be left outside. This is why I mentioned that one of the more tricky parts is keeping your bus on target, and so you have other tools to bolster someone's vehicles, such as the repair grenade or the Punisher, while you have to maneuver around. Looking back, this took a lot longer to explain than I hoped for, but I wanted to go into the details for each of these tools before I start talking about using them in the field. Since I'm going to be using a lot of my own daily ops footage, I thought that if I explain all the nuances before anything else, then I will need to avoid explaining them in detail during this part of the video segment. I can just reference them instead. 
One of the things I really wanted to hammer home for the budding pocket engineer is that experience makes you better rather than your kit. The more tools you search out will allow you to be more flexible, yeah that's true, but experience and practice is still much more important and thankfully when it comes to rep bus driving it's really easy to learn. For this first video I have avoided using my outfit ops as examples because the people I run with know me and they have learned to play around my existence in the armor column. But you don't need to be in a squad. So here's my hot tip. Spawn on the map, find quite literally the first main battle tank you see on the map and stick to them. Keep them alive. If it is a fully crewed 2 out of 2 vanguard, for example, then you will know that you are doing your job right when you start noticing that neither the gunner or the driver is bothering to jump out to repair themselves anymore, or that they will be very interested in keeping you safe by checking a repair grenade or two at you. For this first video, I have also chosen Hassan because people say that this map is not really good for armor play, and I agree, so that's going to be extra challenging for us. So let's see what exactly happens. Now then, I was really lucky to come across a bountied vanguard as my first target in this footage. It was being chased by a harasser and away from the nearest base fight, so since it was very low health, I start off by applying every single repair item that stacks first and foremost. With me here, the Harasser cannot really do much against that Vanguard anymore, but as the Vanguard starts moving around, I instantly stop using my Repair Tool and switch to my Punisher instead, as I'm currently keeping my bus between myself and the Harasser, and would rather not put myself in danger by moving out of cover. Notice that I do drop my ammo crate instead of resupplying from my bus. Uh, this is again simply because if I did that, it would remove the Punisher's effect from the tank. Usually at this point I would deploy and resupply on my grenades, but since I'm not in the squad with this vanguard, I cannot tell if he's going to try and push the harasser, and instead I move my bus closer to remain within Punisher range at least. The one thing you'll notice is that I'm always trying to remain on 4 o'clock from my repair target. This is simply because once I exit a vehicle, I jump out on the left side, so if a target is moving backwards or standing still, it's easier for me to jump out, attach a repair grenade to him and jump back in this way. The Vanguard's gunner deploys his tank mines and then I do the same, but notice that I deploy them on a different location instead of making a pile. Three mines will kill a harasser anyway, so there's no need to tank them. At this point in time, however, notice that I do have a Valk set down to get repaired, and this is going to happen all the time with their vehicles. Notice that he actually lands on the ground, and at that point it would be safe for me to use a repair grenade on him, but I only have one left in stock, and at that point I'm saving it for the Vanguard. I do admit that I wanted to repair the Valk first, and I took my focus off the Vanguard simply because in this fight in particular, the Scout Valk is doing more to contribute to our side than the Vanguard no matter how good the pilot is. Once again, I keep to the Vanguard's left side as he pushes too far forward and gets damaged and moves back. I can stop my bus, prepare a repair grenade for him, and then apply my own repair to once they are within range. While keeping my repairs on the target is important, notice that I'm not moving too far forward as to not get shot myself, as that would take my repairs and my focus away from the Vanguard. The third person view allows me to look over obstacles so I know not to move forward, there's too many enemies there. The Vanguard knows I'm behind him, so the moment he takes damage, I repeat the process. Notice that the counterintelligence implant goes off, and that just means that someone has called me out, whether or not they directly saw me or caught me while spotting the Vanguard, that doesn't matter. I double check behind me, because while I am repairing this Vanguard, I only see its side. So I try to not remain outside of my vehicle as much as possible. The Valk also comes back, but notice that I do not use my Nano Grenade again on him, because even though I have spare ones, simply because this time he's not on the ground. One of the really cool things about the Punisher is that I can afford to miss my shots without wasting nanites. So this time, the damage to the Vanguard comes from nearby, so after I stick a grenade to him, I go off and check. Usually it's easy to kill a heavy who has a lo rocket launcher out on in his hand because they don't usually have enough time to swap weapons. This time the heavy is already moved back to safety, so I break off, I don't engage and go back to my task of keeping the Vanguard safe. 
I was hearing bullets landing next to me, so I quickly pop a canopy to protect me from shots coming from above, but I also keep my eye on the minimap and I see that the heavy's back. I was hoping to catch him off guard, but it seems that I was the target this time and he was already aiming at me. This was a big mistake on my part, and since I could not deploy my Sunderer in the middle of the base, now I have to trek all the way back while being under fire. This next clip is going to illustrate my thought process and prioritization of between friendly targets. Uh, we are approaching a new base with no backup and the lightning pushes forward, but I remain with the vanguard as he is the priority repair target out of the two. Uh, once a enemy harasser pops up, I will first move back to expose less of my vehicle and then try to get a few shots in if I can. The previous battle had a notable amount of light assault, so I set up a alarm. I place my Spitfire somewhere high above where it's out of the way of our friendly vehicles, but at the same time I can easily see. Then I focus back on the current situation. Uh, the Lightning is under heavy fire, and the driver bailed out to apply repairs mid-battle, so I try to do the same. I'm using both grenades and the Punisher, and I'm shooting the underbarrel without waiting them to expire just to make sure that no health is lost. The moment the harasser is back, I realize that the repair grenades are not going to cover the damage, and I go back to the bus to try to save the situation. Uh, during this time, however, the NSO Javelin bike is suddenly in CQC range, and the driver has bailed. You will notice that I first take a look at my Spitfire to see where the infantry is, and that allows me to save my Sunderer from more damage than it has already received from the first brick of C4. The only good thing about this situation is that the harasser shooting the lightning was using Vanu anti-infantry weapons rather than something more potent. It gives me a chance to move up and shield the vehicle with my bus instead, though notice that I had to turn around to get my left side towards it so I don't end up jumping out in front of it. The owner of the lightning sadly got killed by air, so I deploy my Sunder with the hope that they will spawn on it, but soon after that I have taken enough damage, I switch my priority from repairs to self-preservation. Indeed, the moment I get out of the way and scare off the air, my next repair grenade and punisher grenade goes to my own vehicle rather than the lightning or the vanguard. Notice that I keep my Sunder deployed as often as possible with the hope that I get some backup, but the priority shifts again the moment a C4 ferry sets the Vanguard on fire. Notice that the owners have already jumped out to repair it, so instead of repairing, I first block any other incoming damage with my bus, and only then do I focus on the Vanguard. I peek around the bus to see what's going on, see a harasser with low health, and I try to destroy it with light arms fire, only to have to refocus on infantry instead. More C4 ferries on the vanguard, more repair grenades sent to the counter the damage, and it's time to move out of the way myself again. Uh, we end up getting pushed off in a way, yeah, sure, but the force need to do it was in fact substantial. This next video is completely different in that I am a part of a much larger cohesive armor column, all interacting with one another, and here my role is very different. Uh, since large columns have multiple repair vehicles, there is always someone within someone else's repair field. Interlapping Sunder repair fields do not stack, but what does stack is all of your other tools. Punisher grenades, nano grenades, your repair tool, I was given no specific assignment for this operation, so I made my Colossus and the Lee Tank the priority targets. 
but healed and provided additional repairs to anything within my range. I was running a single nanite booster for this event, but later had to activate two at a time because of the amount of repairs that I had to do. Large armor balls like this tend to be very messy and chaotic, so even if I were to try and keep up with a singular target, trying to keep them inside the Sunderer's repair field, it's still only 30 meters, and in full combat situations, yeah, that's not gonna happen. So the moment I have any chance to stop, I'm gonna be using all of my other tools than the Sunday to keep targets topped off. Here, for example, the question would be, why am I not getting within range of the Colossus on my Sunday and instead wasting grenades? Well, because the Colossus is already within range of that other repair bus behind it, so I am adding extra repairs to it in the form of grenades. It's easy to forget mechanics during chaotic moments like this, but two centers do not overlap their repair fields, so if I went there I would be completely useless. Instead, I get out and I stack my repair potential on top of it. A more extreme example of this sort of specialization can be shown during inter-outfit ops, such as like this huge armor zerg that we had on Esimir some time ago. It is abundantly clear that there are plenty of buses around, there's plenty of engineers uh, keeping everyone repaired, but being a pocket NG also means protecting the target in ways that isn't just repairs. So, in this op I'm using my babysitter loadout and catching enemies trying to sneak their way into the armor column while, while other players focus on shooting the actual distant targets and the enemy players, as well as repairing each other. And lastly, here's some footage with much more focused engineer work inside of a small armor squad. Anyway, ladies and gents, thanks for watching this video. My main goal of this tutorial was not only to share my experiences as a pocket NG, but also to promote the rep bus as a type of gameplay. As already mentioned at the start of this video, not everyone have the skills or indeed the frame rate to become a 3 KDR heavy assault. But again, one of the more beautiful things about this game, Vars, is that you have other things to do than just being, you know, shooting planetmans. I've personally forgot how fun and rewarding bus gameplay is, and uh, perhaps that if people are shown that it is more than just driving a vehicle inside of an armor ball, we'd get more vehicle players as well, because they would feel much more supported than they are now. As already showed, you can play around with the rep bus all alone. You can even support even a single tank. Heck, you can park yourself next to a deployed Sunderer at some fight and just keep it alive and save from C4 ferries. As an engineer, each vehicle is your baby and you should be able to take care of it. Anyway, I hope this tutorial was instructional first and foremost, and that the chapters added to the description helped you skip to the more interesting things perhaps, but this is it for me. This was Pocket Angie from Emerald NC, 
and I will see you plant side.